All right, hello everyone. So last time we kind of did the lead up to World War II, why the logic of why Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, it wasn't just out of the clear blue sky. There was a logic, a deranged logic, I would say, but there was a logic about it. And then we got all the way to uh, the US actually interest, uh, entering the war. Um, against Japan and then this incredible favor that Hitler did to FDR by declaring war. If I didn't make that clear last time, the point was the US constitution has these legal constraints where the US president can't just go to war with anybody he wants. He has to go to Congress and ask for a declaration. He could not get that even after Pearl Harbor on Germany and everyone saw that Germany was a greater threat out of nowhere on December 11th, 1941, Hitler declared war on the US and FDR, Churchill, Stalin all breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you for being an idiot and declaring war on the US because now a state of war exists and FDR doesn't have to go to the Congress and deal with all those machinations of politics and just go to war. Uh, Hitler didn't understand the American political system, nor did he care to understand it. He knew very little about the US. He never traveled here. He never studied here very much. He had these bizarre notions, you know, fascist theories about the US that were not very true. And so he assumed that other leaders were kind of like him. They could just decide to go to war whenever they wanted. Roosevelt clearly couldn't. So that was not the case. So um let's start talking about after the declaration of war what actually happens sorry just hang on one second Okay, so um, isolationism to interventionism. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen so you guys can see. And we're doing this. So um, this picture, in case you didn't know, this is Charles Lindbergh. I've probably <laughs> bored you guys to tears the last couple of days showing you the Lindy Hop dance, talking about Charles Lindbergh. I think it's a fascinating case of a person who had everything top of the mountain had everything to his heart's desire and destroyed himself part of it wasn't his fault uh you know his little boy being kidnapped and everything but this picture here this is charles Lindbergh, and uh this is him giving a speech literally november 1941 right before pearl harbor saying really nice things about adolf hitler the america first committee withered away and died after pearl harbor because they kept saying that fascism was not the threat. And then it came to our doorstep with Pearl Harbor. It was the Japanese, the ally of the Germans and the Italians declaring war on us. So uh, clearly we could not hide in the Western hemisphere anymore. We had to take action. Now, once the US does go to war, certain you know right-wingers, people that were fascist sympathizers, they were totally silenced. Um, and the US economy finally springs into action. So um, the US is able to help the allies win the war. It is not because of the intellect of our generals or the bravery of our soldiers, although our generals were very clever and our soldiers were very brave. Mm -hmm when one actually looks at these dynamics on the ground the japanese were far more uh fanatical or had higher morale than us so did the soviets so did the germans um the u.s was a democracy it was highly susceptible to public opinion if americans lost faith in the war then we would have withdrawn from the war and so we had to win the war another way and that was with our huge economic might First six months or so of the war, we were able to supply Britain and the Soviet Union with um, weapons of war or, you know, uh, logistics of war in terms of the Soviets to, to help them out. Um, 
After that, it was the weapons that we provided. It was our economy. When you actually look at the US economy, it is unbelievably extraordinary how much we were able to produce during these years. Again, it took us 18 months to fully mobilize, but even before full mobilization, the US was doing absolutely incredible things. Now, in those first few months, it was kind of crazy. Americans would listen to radio or go to movies and they would see that there were drives to have Americans donate certain things. So Americans were told, donate your scrap metal because we don't have enough mines open to produce steel. And so uh, we need you to donate old parts in your garage or whatever it might be. Come on down to the local corner here. The uh, YMCA or the WCT was here drop off your scrap metal, we'll melt it down and we'll make machine parts out of it. Americans were told to donate their silk. Um, ladies were told, because this was still an age where women who wore skirts, skirt lengths now in the 40s were basically up to the knee, or a little lower, about mid-calf. Women were always to wear silk stockings when showing any part of their legs. They were not allowed to go out bare-legged, not by law, but by social custom. So ladies were told to come down and throw their silk stockings in a big pile. And one has to wonder what on earth did Uncle Sam need all that silk for? Parachutes, actually. Silk is an incredibly strong fiber. Because the Japanese had conquered most of Asia, silkworms are cultivated there in Indochina and China. Silk production was totally cut off in America. And before nylons were produced in the later years of the war, Americans were told, donate your silk, we'll kind of stitch it together and make parachutes out of it. Americans were told to save their grease, bacon grease, things like that when you're cooking breakfast and there's grease left over, don't just dump it down the drain, put it in a little coffee can, set it out by your door, the Boy Scouts will pick it up and we will make nitroglycerin or explosives out of it. How much did all these drives help? Minimally in terms of actual practical reality, but it kept morale high because people thought that they were contributing. It did help a little bit, but really what helped was once Dow Chemical got around to actually making nitroglycerin in huge quantities that actually, you know, explosives were able to turn the tide of the war. Same thing with steel, same thing with everything else, same thing with silk. Same thing with rubber. Um, rubber comes from Indochina, from rubber trees. It's the sap of a certain kind of tree. The Japanese had control of something like 90% of the world's supply. We had to start cultivating rubber in Brazil to be able to get enough out. And then synthetic rubber came in the last year or so of the war where you could actually make it vulcanized in a laboratory. And that helped out a great deal. But that first year, 42 and first half of 43, it was a war of improvisation and the US was, was trying as much as they could. Certain new cities sprang about as new production centers. Los Angeles became the second largest manufacturing center in the world right behind Detroit, the Great Lakes regions of Detroit, Pittsburgh, Cleveland that was making steel and cars. LA became number two because Santa Monica, Long Beach, these huge port cities were making most of the naval vessels that were then going out to go fight the Japanese. Um, huge amounts of movement were going on internally in the US. African Americans desperate to get out of the South and Uncle Sam desperate to have enough soldiers to go fight and enough workers to go work were actively recruiting African Americans to move out of the South to LA, Detroit, New York, anywhere where they could get a job, work in a factory and help for, for the war effort. The Green Revolution, I think I talked about this was on the one hand, petrochemicals that would produce greater yields every year uh, for food, but also mechanized tractors that would go out and do the work of several hundred men so that the US was producing way more food than we could consume or even the world could consume. By the end of the war, we were feeding pretty much everybody. So let's talk about the actual home front and how things worked at home. So first, we had to mobilize everybody who might have been idle for any kind of moment. And so everyone was impressed upon to go fight in the war. Now, this was easy because it was the Great Depression was slowly ending, but it hadn't quite ended yet. And so African-Americans, for instance, almost a million more African-Americans went into the workforce. We had 2.9 million before the war, 3.8 million after the war. So about 900,000 African-Americans moved into factories and started working for the war effort. Women, 
huge amounts of women, both black and white, six and a half million went into the workforce. Now understand, this gets very tricky. This is Rosie the Riveter here. She's not an actual person. She's sort of a, almost like Uncle Sam, sort of a amalgamation of other people. I'm sure they had a model who stood there for the picture, but Rosie the Riveter was this sort of uh, figure to deprogram women to convince them, you don't need to stay at home, you can go and work. It was targeted at married women, married women, women with children, and it was a moderate failure slash success, whatever you want to determine it as. Now, women who were young and single, like my granny, I told you about Mary Hoggett, wonderful woman. She was 19, unmarried, from Mississippi, no prospects. Those type of women indeed moved to other urban areas, worked in factories and produced for the war effort. Women who already were married, and especially women who were married who had kids, by and large did not. A few did, but the United States government opened up tens of thousands of daycares, expecting that married women would flock to the factories, and they didn't. Interesting book I read said, you know, it might be more accurate to have the figure Molly the mom rather than Rosie the Riveter, because most married women who had kids, it was inconceivable. You guys have to understand that all of the literature, like now there's this book called What to Expect When You're Expecting and What to Expect Your First Year, where Essentially, you know, this is the rule book for how you deal with your pregnancy and then deal with your first year kid. Um, and there's new theories about child rearing today. In the 40s, all of these books and all of the literature felt, and this is ridiculous to us today, but they felt that a woman who is a mother needs to stay home and raise her kids. If a woman took that kid to grandma or grandpa or aunt, uncle or at daycare, that child would become a criminal, that child would become a, a juvenile delinquent, that child would become homosexual. There was an entire literature about homosexuality in the 40s and 30s that believed that young boys who had mother abandonment issues would end up gay because they got their gender assignments all mixed up and stuff. This is laughable to us today, but they very much believed it in the 40s. A good mom was a mom who raised her kids and women by and large believed it and could not be deprogrammed and believed it. Yet there were, this is a big country of 135 million people and six and a half million young women who basically were unmarried decided I'm gonna go to the workforce and I'm gonna work. And they did. Young, young women like my granny moved to, from their podunk little town, wherever they were, she was in Mississippi and they moved to Santa Monica and they got a job in Douglas aircraft laying cable to build these airplanes of war. Um, strikes increased. The uh, labor movement in America already very much expanded by the NLRA, the Wagner Act, even expanded further because again, in wartime, you can't have a work stoppage. So if labor unions even threat a work stoppage, the National War Labor Board and the NLRA will show up and broker a compromise and you'll get back to work. So basically unions got raises, 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 more clout, more respect. There was a huge increase in the marriage rate, which is a little weird because men and women were separated. 16 million men, 16 and a half million were drafted or they joined and they were taken out of the country and deployed over three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Women largely were at home. So how was everyone getting married? They were passing like ships in the night, like my granny and grandpa in Long Beach. My grandfather was from uh, Missouri. My grandmother was from Mississippi. Both were stationed in Long Beach for a short period of time. They went to the Pike. They met for a couple of nights. They got introduced by friends and they just decided on a whim, let's get married. When historians looked into this, they found out what was happening was uh, people almost felt it was like daycare or uh, sorry, not daycare, but like uh, summer camp, right? Like I'm 19, I've never been apart from my family. Now I've been uprooted and moved 2000 miles across the country. I have no supervision. It was like being at a camp where the rules didn't apply, where you could stay out late at night, you could stay out drinking. Prohibition had been, been repealed. It was about the only thing you could do. You couldn't buy a house, you couldn't buy a car, you couldn't do a lot of stuff during the war because so much stuff was rationed. But there was plenty of alcohol, there was plenty of dance halls, there was plenty of entertainment and you could go out and watch movies and have a good time and date. And a lot of people got married. The US government 
uh, analyzed this and felt that there was probably 1 million more marriages that occurred than there would have been had there been no war, which was nice, but what that meant was there would be a record number of divorces in the post-war year. The peak year for divorces for a long time was 1946 because all these young men came back. A lot of women, you know, said, oh, goody, you know, you're back again. I haven't seen you in three years. They settled down. They started to try to work it out and they found out, you know what? I only knew you about three days before we got married. I don't really know you. It was crazy times. Um, sociologists have found out there was also a record number of marriages right after 9-11. There's this weird phenomenon when people are wrapped up in huge events in history and they think they might die. They do kind of crazy things and they run out and get married even though they're not in love. My granny and grandpa were in love and they stayed married. Other people were not and they just kind of got married on a whim and many of them got divorced later right after the war. The burden on families at home was rather extraordinary. Um, meaning never before in American history did you have government rationing of basic things. And we had to do it. The army got first dibs on everything. Leather, silk, food, fruits, vegetables, beef, bread, everything, steel. You could not buy a brand new car between 42 and 45. If somebody tells you they have a 1943 or 45 Ford or Chevy, they are lying to you or for that matter, any car, because the world was at war. The, every country decided that there weren't enough cars to go around, there wasn't enough steel to go around. So the steel would all go to airplane and plane, uh, airplane and, and, and uh, naval vessel production. So there were none. Imagine today if the US government said, no one can buy any cars for four years. People just wouldn't stand for it. But during the war, people put up with this stuff. Shoes were rationed. People could buy three pairs of shoes a year. Now, this is before they had modern shoes with new fibers today, like most of us are wearing tennis shoes or you know other kind of comfortable shoes. Most shoes were made out of leather. Leather was tightly rationed during the war, three pairs of shoes per year, which was hard to get around. So what if you only have three pairs of shoes and all three of them have holes in them? Take them to a cobbler, a shoe repair person, now, I want to ask you guys, have you ever in your entire life taken your shoes to a shoe repair place? I have once because I bought a really nice, like, $150 uh, dollar pair of shoes. Floorshine made them really nice shoes, and they started to wear off, like, right at the toe. And so I got them resold because it was $20 to resold them. And it would be another $150 to, to buy a new one. But by and large, we're in a disposable culture now. We just throw out shoes, we buy new ones. People were made to have to go to a shoe repair person, which brings another personal story uh, to the forefront. My father's father, my paternal grandfather, did not serve in World War I or World War II. He was born in 1909, so he was too young for the First World War. He was just 10 years when the first one ended. Uh, and he was a bit old for the second one. When the Second World War rolled around, he was 30 years old, and when it ended, he was 35. He did go down and talk to the recruitment board and tried to sign up, and the first question they asked him, what is your occupation? And he said, I'm a cobbler. I operate a shoe repair place. They said, we need you at home. No one's going to be able to buy shoes for a long time, so you're needed at home. You're an essential worker. If you worked in a defense plant, if you were a cobbler, if you did that kind of stuff, you stayed at home the government prioritized, kind of like they are with the vaccinations now. And they said certain industries are, are integral for the war effort. Other ones go off and fight, right? Teachers, no offense, kind of useless for the war effort. You're not doing anything at home, so go and fight. If you watch Saving Private Ryan, they have a little uh, gambling pool, like what does Captain Miller do? Nobody knows. And at the end, he finally tells everybody, I'm an English teacher. And I always chuckle at that part because He's in the war effort. He's a pretty old man too. He's in his late thirties and they go ahead and send him anyway. That was the way it was. Everything else was rationed. Very little housing construction during the war. Uh, shoes were rationed, cars were rationed, nylons were rationed, gasoline was rationed, fruits and vegetables, butter, milk was rationed. You got every month a coupon, a booklet of coupons. You had to go to the grocery store and they would say, okay, well, you're going to buy two dozen eggs. Let me see your coupons. If you didn't have them, they wouldn't sell them to you. Same thing with beans, same thing with vegetables, same things with everything. Now, Americans would just not stand for this today. We basically say, if you have the money, you should be able to buy whatever the heck you want at a store. 
But for the war effort, we had to make sure that the soldiers at the front, top priority, they get their calories per day. They get their square meals. If you want to fill in the gaps, plant a victory garden. Americans were propagandized. If you're not getting enough beans or tomatoes or strawberries or whatever you need, plant a victory garden in your backyard. These posters were everywhere. Government was also very concerned about child care because so many women went into factories, so many men were off fighting the war, that there were a lot of young kids that they were the first ones home. This is an interesting phrase. This started in World War II, a latchkey kid. I was a latchkey kid in the late 80s, early 90s. Once I had about 10, 11 years old, I was the first one home in the afternoon every day. After about fifth grade, my mother said, here's a key to the house, you're gonna be home open the door for about two hours, you'll be home, call me when you get home. This is before cell phones, I had to get on a landline and call my mother and say, I got home safely. And then she would be home about 5.30 every day. Of course, all the parenting books said that this would lead to juvenile delinquency. And you know what, they were right. Most of the um, statistics that we have now do say that uh, most of the teenage pregnancies that occur, most of the drug uh, use that occurs, is kids in their own homes doing these things without parent supervision. Um, but it was a bit alarmist, all the people that were terrified of juvenile delinquency. Everybody thought the crime rate would skyrocket. Crime rate went down in World War II. Like in World War I, we discovered why, because we took millions of men and sent them out of the country and crime is committed by young men, basically everywhere worldwide. If you take 16 and a half million young men out of the country, who's gonna commit the crimes? Hardly anybody. So actually it wasn't a big deal. Uh, people became more independent, even young kids, and that was okay. Later on in the 60s and 70s, when we have latchkey kids in a non-wartime environment, we say, all right, it's fine, no big deal. I always think it's weird when I find a teenager who doesn't have a key to their own house. I remember my wife's younger brother, um, he was probably 18 before he had a key to the house because mom was always home, she didn't work. My mother-in-law, she was, you know, worked a few years and then just retired. And, and he would get locked out every once in a while. Mom would be off at the grocery store. He'd get home, he'd call us. I'm locked out of the house. And I rolled my eyes. Why don't you have a key to the house? I had a key to the house when I was like 11. Uh, and you're 16 and you don't have a key to the house. Okay, today it seems weird. But back then, kids didn't have a key to the house ever, even when they moved out. So, um, Japanese internment. This is a very tragic story. Um, very shameful. Because the Japanese were an enemy of ours, because they attacked us without warning, and because they were a tiny minority, only about 112,000 in the US, the US government gave into paranoia and did some awful things. So this did not come from top down. The FDR, FDR himself did not come up with this, but General DeWitt, who was in charge of West Coast security, believe that the best thing to do to provide security for the West Coast, uh, because that's where most Japanese Americans lived, was to imprison them, to intern them, so that they could not act as spies or saboteurs in the event of any kind of Japanese invasion. Now, logistically speaking, it would have been impossible for Japan to invade the West Coast of the US. Even Pearl Harbor was a long shot. It was rather miraculous that the Japanese pulled that off. But even that was a raid. It was not an invasion. They didn't take over Oahu. They just flew over it for two hours and then left. Between Hawaii and uh, California, there are no islands. It's well out of range. It was ridiculous to think that they could do it, but people's fears gave in to them. There's a very, very infamous event in uh, Los Angeles history called the Battle of Los Angeles. You can look this up. But in early 1942, uh, some meteorologists had released a weather balloon at Griffith Park Observatory. Some people saw it drifting over LA. They thought it was a Japanese Zero, a fighter plane. People called the police, who called the FBI and called the military. And people imagined that the Japanese were ready to invade. It was announced over the radio. Tens of thousands of people went out to Santa Monica and dug trenches and waited for the Japanese invasion. These weren't even soldiers, these were just citizens. The invasion never came. But it does show you the absolute height of tension and paranoia that existed at the time. And 
In response to this, the U.S. government sent out notices to all 112,000 Japanese Americans on the West Coast in California, Oregon, and Washington that they were going to be interned. They were given no trial. They were told, you have a day. You're all, you're all allocated one suitcase, and then you'll be interned. Nobody knew how long the war would last. Now, we know it from history. It will last four years, but people had no idea how long it would last. Japanese Americans showed up. They were then shipped to very remote areas. Manzanar is one of them, but there were dozens of camps all over the interior of the US, always in very rural desert areas so that even if you escaped, you couldn't get free, right? If you've ever been to Manzanar, you know why the Japanese were incarcerated there because you would die of thirst before you got anywhere. It's a hundred miles in every direction. They were guarded by machine gun guard towers and they were imprisoned for four years. Their freedom taken away, their property taken away. Imagine if you had to just leave your house within one day and you had to sell it, what prices you would get. There were a lot of white people that showed up and, and lowballed the Japanese Americans, bought their homes, their farms for very, very cheap. Walter Knott of Knott's Berry Farm, very much capitalized, bought up all of his neighbor's berry farms and then built this huge empire of Knott's Berry Farm afterwards. And doesn't mean you need to feel guilty about going to Knott's Berry Farm, but Walter Knott did build his empire by buying up all his neighbor's uh, berry farms when they were all interned in 1942. Um, for African-Americans though, the war was a bit of a step forward. Um, many African-Americans complained that although they had moved to urban areas, in some ways their lives were getting better, still there was intense discrimination. Uh, workplaces were still heavily segregated. Um, black uh, uh, workers, whether male or female, were not promoted so that they could be foremen or you know, uh, any kind of boss uh, in any amount. And so A. Philip Randolph, a great labor union organizer, he was the leader of the Pullman Porters Union. If you guys don't know the Pullman Porters, Pullman was the largest railroad company in the country at the time. And if you watch like old movies, even I Love Lucy episodes, there was sort of this black army of workers who worked on all the trains in America. And they were basically the stewards, stewardesses, flight attendants of the time. You got onto a train and a black person come up to you, take your bag and store it. They'd come down and take your ticket. They'd get you your food and everything. Uh, these were jobs that were tough for white people, but it was about the best job that a black person could find at the time, essentially. It was, they were pretty prized. You could make a decent living um, and you had free travel all throughout the country, which was a benefit. A Philip Randolph ran this union and he said, we are gonna go on strike because there's so much discrimination, there's so much racism. Uh, this was a time when the US military was still segregated. Black men could not be promoted uh, above certain levels. I think they couldn't get a, uh, promoted above a sergeant at the time. They always had a white captain or, or other officer. And so they just said, you know, this is very hypocritical. We're telling the world we are the ones who are fighting against racism and evil. And, uh, there's still racism in America. There are these awful cases. I mean, um, at the time in US history, we had enough technology to actually figure out blood typing. And they figured out there was A, B, A, B, positive, negative, O, yet still blood bags were segregated by race, meaning that on your dog tag, it would say your name, your rank, your serial number, your blood type and your race. So that if you were white and you were shot and you were bleeding, the medic would not give you a black person's blood, even if they had the same blood type. And they knew scientifically it would save you and there'd be no problem with it. They still would not do it. That was the America we were living in at the time. There are several documented cases of African-American soldiers whose job it was to be stationed in the South guarding German POWs. There were cases of Germans who surrendered to us in North Africa, in Italy, in France. Those Germans were shipped to the American South, to Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, to pick cotton because there was a shortage. So many black people move out of the South. Um, and the white landowners treated these German boys pretty good, better than their black workers. They would take them to go eat at the, you know, uh, uh, restaurant at the end of the day, buy them all burgers and shakes and fries. And the black 
military guards that were guarding them were told, you have to wait outside the restaurant. And the German Nazi prisoners of war were allowed to go inside the restaurants. So this is still an America that has a lot of work to do. And so Ayla Philip Randolph said, we have to strike. FDR said, I can't have a strike. Number one, this will slow down production. Number two, it will be a horrible propaganda boon to our enemies. Our enemies will use that and say, America's divided, it's racist, et cetera. So let's not have this march. And so A. Philip Randolph said, okay, instead of a march, we will have a double V for victory. We'll have victory over Jim Crow and the Nazis at the same time. And so FDR said, let's cut a deal. I will issue executive order 8802 which will ban discrimination in all defense jobs. Not in the military itself, so the military would still remain segregated, but the workplace now. If you had a job in a defense plant and you were black, that means you could be promoted to be in charge of white people. This went through, it caused huge disruptions. In Detroit, there were massive riots because of this, because a handful of black men were talented, they got promoted, to foremen, they had 10 or 12 white workers beneath them. The black bosses started giving orders and a lot of white guys said, I will not go back to work. I will not do my job because a black man's ordering me around. It was like you lost face. You lost your own value that you had a black boss. So this is a very different America at the time. Um, we still have our problems today, but this was just right in the middle of Jim Crow still. Big riots in Detroit. We had riots out here in LA not black white riots, but black Hispan or uh, white Hispanic riots. So here's what happened basically. LA changed a lot during World War II. First of all, virtually all the Japanese people were incarcerated and shipped out. So to little Tokyo shrank to almost nothing. Um, <coughs> second is that all these white folks who had never been to LA before they were from Iowa and Kansas and everything. Basically, if you were drafted and you were west of the Mississippi, they sent you out to LA. If you were east of the Mississippi, they shipped you out to New York or Mobile Bay or New Orleans, and then you would be shipped out to fight the Germans. A lot of these white folks had never seen a Mexican person before, and they came to LA and they were like, whoa, this is a little bit weird. What are all these Mexican people doing in Iowa? Which instead they should have been asking, what am I doing in Los Angeles? And a lot of young Mexican American men, Chicano men were very proud they had good jobs now that the war was going on. They had money. And many of them uh, in the cultural norm of the time, they would buy so-called zoot suits. So let me see if I can find a picture of a zoot suit real quick so that you guys can see what it actually looks like. Um, but this was the custom of the time. If you had a good job, you wanted to go out and buy a zoot suit. And so they did. So let's see, This these are pretty good. I'll get you. So this is just something I found real quick. But you guys can Google zoot suit and see it. But this is basically a zoot suit. Usually the pants are a bit baggier. Now, here's the deal with all of this. During the war, there were intense restrictions on everything. The government came in and said, clothing manufacturers, we're going to ban certain things because there's not enough cotton and wool and everything that we can produce I mean, think about it, 16 and a half million soldiers, you're gonna need a pair of pants for every day of the week, 16 and a half million times seven pairs of pants, plus shirts, plus socks, plus shoes, plus everything. So leather was rationed, cotton was rationed, everything. So if you went into a store, clothing changed. Instead of these long coats, like you see going down to mid thigh, coats went up to waist length. Uh, pants, instead of having a cuff where it's kind of rolled up two or three inches and stitched, pants started to be manufactured without the cuff double-breasted suits where it crosses your chest twice and it's buttoned on one side. No longer, it would meet in the middle because it's a waste of fabric. This is the invention of the bikini came out during this time. It used to be women would wear one piece, well, I mean, women used to wear head to toe clothing, but starting in the late twenties, early thirties, women would wear one piece bathing suits that were pretty modest. The bikini came out in the forties because it saves space if you cut out the midsection, right? Um, all of this came out during World War II. It was just for the war effort. And most people supported it. They said, all right, you know, we got to do this. Um, you could go to your friend on the side who was a tailor and say, hey, I still want that zoot suit. 
with the double-breasted suit, with the long coattails, et cetera. It violated all the wartime restrictions, but you would do it because you were proud and you wanted to. You had money, you wanted to go out on a Saturday, go dancing, you know, do the Lindy Hop and meet a girl. And so a lot of Chicano men were wearing these and walking around the streets. Um, hats by and large uh, weren't produced very much. A lot of people said, you know, hats are very fashionable for men, but it's a lot more cloth. We don't need them, so no more hats still wore them, you know? And so a lot of white folks saw this and said, you are disloyal. You're not joining the army. You've got a good job here and you're violating all the war measures. So sailors, white sailors from, you know, Iowa, Nebraska, who were now stashed, stationed in Los Angeles would just get in their pickup trucks. They would drive around East LA and look for anyone wearing a zoot suit. They would jump out and just beat them up brutally. Of course, Chicano men would then travel in packs so that they would be protected. This was now a gang. And so there would be these huge fights that would then escalate and this erupted into a month long worth of riots in June of 43 known as the Zoot Suit Riots. Because of this, the police in LA cracked down on Zoot Suits. They started arresting men who wore them in public and they started trying to have a huge police presence to stop this. I want you to note no other belligerent country in the war had riots during World War II. The Japanese didn't, the Nazis didn't, the Italians didn't, the Japanese didn't, the, the British didn't. These were all societies that were very uh, homogenous. They were societies without much immigration or racial differences. The US had a lot. Despite all of this, we still outproduced everybody in the war. Um, during the war, the US was twice as productive as Germany and five times as productive as Japan. That's not a total number, that's a per capita number. So understand we had 135 million people, the Germans had 70 million. So we're basically twice the population of Germany and we outproduced them two to one per capita, which is four to one overall. We outproduced the Japanese five to one. They had 100 million, we had 135 million. So it was really about seven to one in total numbers. We were unbelievably productive in terms of airplanes, in terms of naval vessels, in terms of everything. The major motif at the war effort was that Americans now had money for the first time in a long time since the depression, but it was almost like a weird Twilight Zone episode where you had a fat bank account, but you couldn't go out and buy stuff. You couldn't go out and just buy a whole new wardrobe. Everything was rationed. You couldn't out and just buy the whole grocery store. Everything was rationed. You couldn't buy homes unless they were built before the war because not much home construction was going on. There were no new cars built. So most people just threw their money in the bank account or they bought bonds and they made a little checklist. My granny told me, she said, every month I had a huge amount of savings and I just made a list. The first day that the war is over, I'm going to buy X. The second day this, the third day this. And everybody made plans for when the war ended. When the war finally did end, the U.S. had a huge debt. We were 25% debt to GDP ratio. GDP is sort of your country's yearly income or production. Debt is how much you owe. And so the US had only about a quarter, 25% debt to GDP before the war. After the war, we had 125% debt to GDP. Today, it's about 110, 112%. So it's high today, but not as high as it was at the end of World War II. We spent a fortune in World War II, and that put everyone back to work. If you had a pulse, you could get a job. Every My granny was 19, and she she's like, I had more money than I ever had in my entire life. So it's a weird paradox. On the one hand, everyone had money, everybody was working, but the consumer economy was very much limited. But I don't want to oversell it. Everyone in every other country at war dealt with far more deprivation than we did. You could still go to the movies, you could still go get a drink, you could go to a dance hall, you could buy a lot of stuff in America, in Britain and in the Soviet Union especially, but also in Germany and Japan. Almost any kind of normal life which just didn't exist. There were bombs falling on your cities all the time. U.S. didn't have to deal with that. So the military, we had to go from 200,000 to 16 and a half million soldiers in just six years time. Now in 1940, even before we joined the war, FDR started a peacetime draft, bumped that up to a million, but it was still too short. So we had to get everybody working for the war effort. About a third volunteered, about two thirds were drafted, about 10 million drafted, about uh, 
about five and a half million joined voluntarily. The draft was extraordinary. This uh, draft encompassed all men in the US 18 to 36. 36, uh, 36 to me is pretty old to be marching around in France with a machine gun fighting the Germans, but we needed every last man we could have. And so it, it took a lot. A third of all men that were uh, drafted or came down to the, uh, the board to volunteer were screened out. Um, only Britain and America were fairly enlightened in this in that if you had a disability, you were screened out. If you did, couldn't see properly, if you didn't have 20-20 vision, if you had flat feet, that used to be a big thing. Now you just get a Dr. Scholl's insole and it's no big deal, but it was felt if you had flat feet, it would mess up your posture, your back would hurt, you couldn't march long distances. I mean, it's tragic. There are stories of young men who committed suicide because they tried to volunteer to serve their country and they were told, sorry, you have flat feet, you can't serve. And they were just dishonored and they killed themselves. Not huge numbers, but many did. And it was, you know, terribly troubling to a lot of people. Most of the reasons people were screened out is because they were illiterate, they couldn't read or write. They had what they called at the time battle fatigue, which is you suffered from kind of uh, nervous anxiety. And so they would test you. They'd have you, you know, crawling under barbed wire with machine gun fire. And if you panicked, if you couldn't handle it, they would just say, sorry, you just can't serve. If you were gay, they didn't even have a term at the time for this. Uh, the term homosexual existed, but it wasn't really used by the military. It was used by like sociological journals. Um, they would ask you a question on your questionnaire when you showed up. And that question was, do you like girls? And if you said no, they would just screen you out, basically. Women were not drafted, but they did volunteer and they did serve. They served in wax and waves, a women uh, auxiliary corps. Um, and they were secretaries, they were nurses, they were code breakers. Quite often they were better educated than their male counterparts, but because of sexism at the time, they were paid far less. Um, but never drafted. In the Soviet Union, they actually drafted women. 10% of the Red Army fighting the Germans were drafted women. In Britain, they drafted women to go work in the factories. In America, you had your choice. We were that rich, that populated, that comfortable, that women were told, we would really like you to help the war effort, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. So most where married women just said, no. Uh, I want to be a good mother to my children. I just won't. And they didn't have to. We could still win the war even, you know, with them staying at home. Minorities. African Americans served in huge numbers and served with, served with distinction despite discrimination. A lot of them were left to digging ditches and being in auxiliary roles. Um, many people thought that African American men would be cowardly. They couldn't serve, but most of them broke the mold and served with distinction. This is going to give a huge boost to the civil rights effort later is that many black men are going to say, I risk my life fighting the Japanese or the Germans. I'm not going to be afraid of Jim Crow anymore. And it gave him a huge boost of patriotism. Japanese Americans, this is incredible. Most of them were interned during World War II, and yet they still were able to join. The military came into these camps and said, hey, you're just sitting around doing nothing. Would you like to serve? And many of them did. Amazingly, their whole family was incarcerated in these concentration camps. And they said, yes, I still love my country and I'd like to serve. They were not used to fight the Japanese. They were sent to Germany because the feeling was they would defect. There were these old notions that you had a racial consciousness and that you'd be programmed to go support your race, which was ridiculous. I mean, if that was the notion, then wouldn't German Americans go and defect and fight for Germany? No, people didn't believe that, but people believed racially the Japanese would defect and go work for the Japanese. Uh, Navajo Americans, uh, the largest tribe in the United States, um, had a language that was very unique. Navajo is a unique language where there is no syntax rules. Syntax is the orders of words in a sentence. I don't speak Navajo, I don't understand it, but uh, I've read several books that argue that you can mix up the words in any order in a sentence and it means the same thing. And it was the only code that the Americans figured out that the Japanese could just not break. We were breaking the, our, our mathematicians were extraordinary. The Germans would change their codes almost weekly and we would break them very easily. We could read almost everything they were saying every day of the war, the same thing with the Japanese. Once we figured out 
you don't even need to encode anything. You just have one person in Navajo talking to another. The Japanese could not break it because there was no mathematical equation it was based on. It was a very unique language. And medicine took a huge quantum leap forward during World War II. Number one, penicillin. Penicillin comes out in the 20s. And this was the main killer of people. If you got shot in the Civil War or World War I, it was a death sentence. Even if you didn't die of bleeding or of the bullet hitting a vital organ, you would die of an infection or sepsis in a few days, almost all the time. And now, if you got shot, if you got shrapnel, you could get a blood transfusion almost immediately because in every platoon, there was a medic who had a red cross on his helmet to identify him so that the enemy wouldn't shoot them. Sometimes they wouldn't, sometimes they would, but they had on ice blood for every member of the platoon. You would throw these sort of uh, chemical coagulants on any wound to stop the blood flow. You could then find a vein and get blood flowing into the person. And then you could shoot them up with morphine. You had a whole belt full of morphine. They don't do this anymore, but they used to. And then you could give the person blood. Everything was blood type. You look at their tags, you say, okay, type A, I have some here. Still segregated by, you know, by race. But you could get that into the person to save their life. Now, uh, moving on. I won't spend a ton of time on the actual war, but I do want you to know what was all this production for? How did we mobilize it? How do we use it? Now, Germany is the priority. They are the greatest threat to peace. We need to conquer them first. So FDR was concentrating on them, sending everything across the Atlantic in the first couple of years. It is almost a year before the US can even shoot back at a German because they had fortified most of Europe by this time. <coughs> we enter the war December 11th, 1941. And it's not until November of 42 before the US actually lands in North Africa in Algeria to go fight against the Germans. Now, most historians look at this whole campaign as a bit of a sideshow. What did this actually accomplish? Not all that much, but we needed to get practice. We needed to boost our morale so that we could say, why is everyone donating their grease and you know their silk and everything? We needed some victories so that people will you know feel good and keep their morale up. And so FDR authorized the torch landings in North Africa, which was occupied France, but because Germany had invaded France, they controlled it. And the US was able to launch this amphibious landing in Algeria and conquer that pretty easily and then move steadily eastward to Libya, where they liberated that in the summer of 43. Um, the Germans were defeated at Stalingrad by the Soviets in February of 43. That's a big turning point of the war. The US then was able to sort of leapfrog from Libya to Sicily in the Mediterranean in 1943 in July, practicing amphibious landing. Amphibious, understand what this means, right? An amphibian is an organism that can live either in the sea or on land. And so the idea was you had to convert a navy into an army instantaneously. No one had ever done this. This is what stymied Napoleon. Napoleon had the strongest army in the world in the early 1800s. It was just 26 miles from the coast of France to Britain. And Napoleon could not figure out once you crossed the English Channel, how do you then land and transfer all those men to the shore? And he just could not figure it out. American engineers figured it out in about 18 months. You have landing craft. They're basically like lifeboats. They're sort of a box that you have. You see it in Private Ryan with reinforced steel and these ferry men from these huge vessels. And you then send them on shore that way. You can't have a huge vessel land on a shore because it's a deep water vessel. You need to land at a port. The problem is ports are heavily fortified. If you wanna land on a beach, right? Think about this. A huge vessel wants to land at Huntington Beach where there's no harbor. How does it do that? Well, they anchor about a mile offshore and then you ferry people with the landing craft. We had to build hundreds of thousands of landing craft in New Orleans and then prepare them over in Britain. And Sicily was sort of the, the staging ground for practice to do this. And we conquered it very easily in July of 43. Then we had to close the Atlantic Gap. The Germans were sinking so much of our vessels that were headed towards Great Britain. We had to escort all of the uh, merchant vessels with aircraft, with radar, and with um, uh, 
with bombs, essentially. This was the way we did it. I, the US basically solved every problem in World War II with aircraft. Don't even ask me how they did it, but I guess you can find a periscope on a submarine with radar, swoop down and bomb it, and that's what we did. Completely obliterated the German uh, naval fleet by about July, August of 43, so that the Atlantic was just an open sea lane. Okay, we had to kind of crack that problem. It took a year and a half to do. Once we did, we could build up Britain all day long. Then came the Normandy landings. The US had to leave Britain heavily fortified and then land in France. Um, lots of logistics here, lots of planning. And it was amazing it came off, but it was done. The weather had to be just right. The tides had to be just right. Everything had to be just right. And we pulled it off. It was rather extraordinary that we did. The key here was what the British called Mulberry, which was portable harbors. We had to land at a flat, narrow beach, not a port, right? Calais is the port. That's where all the Nazis thought we were going to land. We didn't land there. We landed at Normandy. We had to build a harbor within about six hours. And we did basically disassembled like a Lego set. And then engineers would kind of land. If you see Private Ryan, like you see the advance force land and take the fortresses that are there, the bunkers. And then the engineers would land about six hours later and then with welding torches sort of build a harbor and then the big deep water ships could come in, pour as much men and materiel into France and the Germans could just not keep up. They tried very hard six months later to mount a huge defense of France with the Battle of the Bulge and the US annihilated them, again with aircraft. This is how we solved every problem in World War II because we built more aircraft than everybody else. Um, if you just blanket the skies with aircraft, they can swoop down and bomb anything, submarines, tanks, whatever you want to call it. And this is essentially what we did. Um, the statistics are extraordinary. My favorite statistic of US production is that in one year, in 1944, the peak year of the war, because 45, the year ended before the war ended, the year ended in September. In that one year in 1944, the US produced 96,000 airplanes which is a lot and you don't have any frame of reference, but I will tell you that was more airplanes built in that year than in the history of the world before then because the airplane was pretty new. It was just you know built in the early 1900s. The US alone in that year built more airplanes than had existed in the prior uh, history of humankind, which was pretty extraordinary. And the British produced about 20,000 uh, and so did the Canadians the Germans and Japanese were just not able to outproduce us at that particular point. Now, there remains this moral question that we've dealt with ever since. Um, most historians are of the point of view that the African, Sicilian, and Italian campaigns didn't really do all that much to end the war effort. Only about 5% of the German army was in that area of the war. Most of them were in Europe. Most of them were fighting the Russians. But that's all we could do. And I would argue um, it wasn't nothing. It made sure that when the war was over, we were in charge of Italy and not the Russians and not the Germans. And so we got to build a wonderful democracy in Italy. Um, in any case, all we could do in 42 and 43 to the Germans was to bomb them. We couldn't land men anywhere in the European continent. We just couldn't do that until June of 44. So what do you do? The Russians are getting slaughtered in the East. To relieve pressure, the US started a campaign of flying planes from Britain bombing locations first in France and then in Germany, civilian populations, intentionally so. This has been controversial at the time and ever since, but I will say this. Whatever one thinks of the morality, it was effective. We know that the Germans who were fighting in Stalingrad and Kursk and in the Eastern Front against the, the Soviets, they had to move men, they had to move artillery, they had to move you know, important uh, aircraft to Germany itself to defend their own homeland. And the US and the British air forces completely destroyed the German air force above the skies of Germany in 42, 43, and 44. It took a while, it took a lot of effort, but by 1945, the Germans had hardly a plane and we could just roll uh, unobstructed right into Germany, and so could the Russians. And so it was effective, but it does raise a question. In Hamburg, for instance, in July of 43, the US came up with a new technology. It was called window. 
Um, the Germans had radar. They could see our planes coming and they could scramble their aircraft and get them in the air, their lighter craft to shoot down our bombers and their artillery. And so the US government came up with this idea that if you had aircraft that just dropped out all these aluminum strips, right? Like little gum wrappers, little teeny ones, but tens of thousands of them, you just open the bomb bay and dropped them all. It scrambled the radar installations they had. They could not see our aircraft. And then you could just fly freely over Germany and bomb. We did this in July of 43 in Dresden and burned alive about 100,000 Germans in, or sorry, not in Dresden, this is in Hamburg. Uh, we would bomb Dresden later. Hamburg is a beautiful city. It's very similar to uh, Amsterdam. There's beautiful canals that are there. It's an old ancient city with a cathedral. It was completely obliterated, just walked, uh, just wiped off the map. Probably 80, 90,000 people were burned alive. The um, there were huge thunderstorms, essentially firestorms, where the bombs would hit, they would ignite fires, and then because it was summer and it was dry, the fires would then uh, create these huge windstorms, and they just tore through Hamburg, burning people alive in their own homes. The fires were so hot that the canals of Hamburg boiled, quite literally. So <laughs> this is quite a nasty campaign. People kind of wonder... Is it okay to blur the line between soldier and civilian? Well, the US and the British did indeed do this. It was effective to end the war effort. That seems pretty clear. Was it moral? I leave that to other people to kind of judge that. So the war is gonna to grind to a halt in early 45. By February 45, it's very clear the US is gonna win. So FDR and Churchill will travel to Yalta to go meet with Stalin and start planning for the post-war peace. Britain wants to keep its empire. Stalin wants to keep Eastern Europe. America wants to you know, try to liberate Western Europe and certain agreements are made, but a lot of this is sort of left in the post-war period we'll talk about later. Germany finally surrenders on May 8th. Hitler committed suicide on April 30th. Um, and essentially the German people fought to the end, but by early May, it seemed that this was pointless. The Americans and British swept in from the West, the German or the Russians from the East, they meet uh, in the middle of Germany, kind of dividing the country in half. There was no point to fight anymore and the Germans finally just surrendered. The Japanese would fight for another four months, but the US was finally victorious. And this is a picture here of a Russian soldier on the roof of the Reichstag with this sort of artillery captains here raising the hammer and sickle. This is one of the most ironic things after ever. Hitler ordered Germany to invade the Soviet Union in 1941 to eradicate communism. And in so doing, the Soviets swept in, conquered half of Germany and half of Germany would live under communism for the next 45 years. Pretty ironic. In the grand scheme of things, the US probably contributed only about a quarter of the casualties on the German army meaning that the Soviets did most of it. Really, the Soviets deserve most of the credit for defeating Nazi Germany in World War II. They're the ones on the ground fighting for their lives and they did most of the effort. If you look at these cemeteries in Germany or in the Soviet Union, these World War II cemeteries, most of them, almost all of them, it said on all the gravestones like where they died and all the German ones say Toten in Osten, right? Died in the East, died in the East, died in the East. Almost all of them say that. A tiny fraction was sent to the West or sent to Italy and uh, Sicily and Africa to go fight against the Americans and the British. The Soviets did the most. Soviets lost half a million soldiers in the last month of the war capturing Berlin. This is more in the last month than the US lost in all of the war. The US lost 292,000 soldiers in World War II, less than in the COVID epidemic, which is half a million right now. Now, 292,000 is a lot, don't get me wrong. But in the largest war in human history, we got off pretty easily. We used our technology, we used airplanes, we used every method we could to minimize damage to our actual soldiers and defeat our enemies. Japan was another story. Japan fought bitterly to the very, very, very end. And the US deserves a lot of credit here because we fought with almost no allies. The only ally we really had 
was China. And China was never going to win on its own. Really, all they did was just refuse to surrender stubbornly. The, the Japanese invaded China in 1937, steadily moving westward, but the Chinese just kind of moved you know, the front line and most of their factories westward and refused to surrender, which bogged them down and tied down the Japanese. But the Chinese were never going to actually win this war on their own. The British helped a little bit in Burma by refusing to surrender, but they surrendered Singapore and Malaysia and everything else. Um, it was the US who pretty much single-handedly defeated the Japanese on their own. Now, immediately after Pearl Harbor, we had almost no Navy to fight with other than four aircraft carrier. And we used those mainly to fight the Japanese. Um, the method would be dubbed island hopping. The idea was Pearl Harbor was the furthest point westward to go fight the Japanese. And we were never gonna be able to just send all of our soldiers and Navy immediately to Japan to attack, that we would have to like crossing a stream or a river, we'd have to hop from one little rock to the next, right? We'd have to conquer one island at a time amphibiously until we got to the Japanese home islands. And it would take some time. We would fight the Battle of the Coral Sea in May of 42 and be victorious. Midway is the big turning point. Midway is a little island that the US had as a colony right in the middle of the Pacific, about equidistant between California and Japan. And the Japanese were going to attack in June of 42. We cracked their codes. We knew they were coming. There's a movie made about Midway very recently where they tell this story. The Japanese uh, were going to attack. They had their planes in the air ready to go, but we cracked their codes. We knew what direction they were coming from, what date they were coming, what time they were coming. Our planes got in the air before them. We were outnumbered about three to one and we were able to defeat them. This was the turning point of the war. We had four aircraft carriers before the battle and all four survived. The Japanese had six before and they only had two left after the battle. They were never able to rebuild fast enough because our shipyards in Long Beach and in uh, San Diego were churning out ships much faster. We had more access to steel. We had more access to, to weapons. We had, we had just more resources and more people than the Japanese and were just able to outproduce them. And in those first few months of the war, it basically ended for the Japanese in June of 42. It was just a matter of time at that point. We then hopped to Guadalcanal between August and February, uh, August 42 and February 43. Tarawa would be in November of 43. Guam, Saipan, and Tinian in 1944. And this is the big deciding factor. The US reconquered the Philippines in October of 44. It took essentially two and a half years to reconquer the Philippines, but when we did, we completely obliterated the Japanese Navy. They had nothing left. So going into January of 1945, the last year of the war, the Japanese really have no Navy and no Air Force left. However, they had over a million soldiers in Japan still, or in uh, uh, China, still fighting, still on a rampage, still murdering people on a daily basis, but they were stranded. They couldn't even get back home because there were no ships left. Uh, they had all the oil in Indonesia, but they couldn't get these oil tankers back to Japan because U.S. Uh, submarines based in, in uh, the Philippines would mercilessly sink these oil tankers coming back. So they had no gasoline left. They had no Navy left. They had no Air Force left. And their army was stranded in China committing horrible atrocities, but no threat to the U.S. The U.S. then hopped to Iwo Jima in February of 45 in a bitter battle that lasted 35 days, but we eventually secured the island. And in the very last battle of the war, Okinawa, April to June, tens of thousands of casualties. And this really was a wake up call for the US. Although Japan seemed to be on the verge of defeat, they were not surrendering. They were incredibly stubborn. They started to use their very limited fuel to fuel up airplanes just enough to take off and then crash into American ships, usually fully laden with bombs, you know, hiring, you know, young boys as young as 12, 13, 14, not giving them any lessons on how to land a plane, but just take off and crash right into it. So these waves of airplanes would be landing into American uh, cruisers, destroyers, aircraft carriers off the coast of Okinawa, very unnerving. And Americans started to take that as a lesson that if the Japanese were fighting this harshly, that thousands of young Japanese people were willing to commit suicide to defend the emperor, what would it be like when we actually landed in the Japanese home islands fighting house to house, kind of like how the Russians did in Berlin? It would be ugly, it would be grotesque. 
there was a huge uproar on the home front. There were about 30,000 casualties in Okinawa and Americans just said, why are we fighting anymore? Let's just cut a deal with the Japanese. People forget this, but in the summer of 1945, people were war weary. They didn't want to fight anymore. And there was a lot of talk that maybe we just need to cut a deal. Third, there were huge concerns over the debt. Although the US was the most uh, secure country in the world, we had spent a fortune, 125% of GDP. And many people felt, who's going to rebuild the world after the war if we're broke? We're going to need money to station troops in these countries. We're going to need to have a stable economy. If we keep fighting for another two, three years, invading the Japanese islands, everyone will be broke. And this war will end like World War I. And we'll be in another war very soon. There were trouble in the last few bond drives. They were falling short for the first time in the entire war, where they'd say, we need to get you know, $10 billion in this bond drive. And they would fall very short of their targets. There was a conscious switch in March, April, 1945 to switch instead of an amphibious landing in the island hopping campaign is too brutal, it's too costly. Let's just bomb the Japanese home islands and try to get them to surrender that way. This is an aerial photo right here of Tokyo on the night of March 9th, 1945. This is the most brutal bombing campaign in history. It wor was worse than Hiroshima, it was worse than Nagasaki. Tokyo was the largest Japanese city it was a wooden city, not like in Germany where the cities were cobblestone streets and, and brick houses. Everything was wooden. All the houses were wooden and paper. It burned incredibly well. And now uh, napalm was invented this last year of the war. And so the bombs would fall, they would explode and this sort of intensely high explosive would ignite and then it would burn through the whole city. Uh, 50 square miles of Tokyo was incinerated on that night. 110,000 people burned alive in their homes, men, women, and children. And that was the first city. The U.S. then moved on to 67 other cities, completely burning them and destroying them, thinking this would be a better way to end the war because we don't have to actually land and, and, and subject our soldiers to casualties. You know, you have... Uh, a thousand bombers fly over Tokyo, you might lose six or seven, you might lose 150 or 200 men in those bombers, but you killed 110,000 Japanese. They could not withstand this. So we moved from Tokyo to Nagoya and then Kyoto and then just on and on and on and on and on, all through March, April, May, June, July, all during the late spring and early summer of 45, a different city was targeted. A thousand bombers would fly over and bomb and destroy which is unbelievable and extraordinary, but this was the plan the last few months of the war. The Japanese stubbornly still refused to surrender. Lots of debates now about the terms of that surrender, that the US had this notion, unconditional surrender. You must surrender without conditions. We dictate the conditions to you after the war. Many historians say, had we made it very plain and clear to the Japanese months before that they could keep their emperor that they might have surrendered earlier. We don't know because it was never offered, but we just said surrender and we write the conditions. Well, the Japanese were no dummies. They saw that we, what we were doing in, in Germany, we were rounding up all the top Nazis, putting them on trial and hanging them for crimes against humanity. And they felt that their emperor was a God and that if we defeated them and they turned their God over to us and we executed them, they would suffer uh, you know, shame uh, disrepute, ignominy, that it would just be the worst thing in humanity for them. And so they said, we're not going to surrender. No, not under those conditions. So they continued to fight and fight and fight and fight through Iwo Jima, through Okinawa. Then in the midst of all this, the U.S. invented a new, incredibly destructive weapon, the atom bomb. It's rather amazing that during all of this, all through all the rationing and everything, the US was able to invent a new super weapon, which we don't even have time to get into this whole Manhattan project. But the US scientists, engineers figured out how fission worked. Uh, basically, you have two pieces of uranium that you enrich. And in the 30s, they realized with these kind of like vices, these clamps, if you crank them and got them close together, they would shed neutrons essentially. And as you got them close together, it created a chain reaction of these neutrons bouncing off each other. It would create tremendous heat, light, and like the windows would burst and everything. They said, it'd be really cool if you could get them right on top of each other. 
And finally, it took years and years to realize this, but if you enrich enough uranium, you can shoot a uranium bullet into a cavity, basically, inside a bomb. That's what it is, basically. You detonate TNT inside this casing. A uranium bullet goes into a uranium hole, essentially. They're right on top of each other, and then it creates this huge chain reaction of an explosion. And this was Hiroshima. The US dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and in an instant, the whole city was just wiped out or the downtown area anyway, just a square mile of just huge explosion. Amazingly, the Japanese still did not surrender on April 6th. We told them we had an arsenal of these weapons that we had hundreds of them that every night we would drop another bomb and the Japanese would cease to exist as a race if they didn't surrender. For three days, they still did not surrender. On April 8th, the Soviet Union, this was now three months, right? The Germans surrendered on May 8th. Stalin told us at Yalta, Germany's top one priority, when Germany surrenders, give me three months and then I'll mobilize my men and send them to Germany. He was good to his word. On August the 8th, he declared war, sent his soldiers into Mongolia, into Manchuria, into North Korea, and just steamrolled over the Japanese. They were just a broken people at that point. Amazingly, this was the turn. If you actually look at the Japanese cables, which we were we had broken their codes and we were listening to them, they didn't seem to be that bothered with the bombing campaign or the atomic bombing campaign. But when the Russians declared war, their eyes just sort of lit up and they said, it's over for us. The US will occupy the Southern half. The Russians will occupy the Northern half. The Russians are absolute savages and barbarians. We are in deep trouble, but they just seemed unperturbed by the bombs. It was rather extraordinary. The next day on August 9th, we dropped a bomb on Nagasaki, a fusion bomb and obliterated that city. Finally, the, U, the Japanese turned to us because they were so scared of the Soviets and they said, we surrender to you because we'd rather have an American occupation than a uh, Russian occupation. Finally, the Japanese surrendered in mid-August. The peace treaties finally signed on September 2nd and almost exactly six years to the day World War II was over. The next month, the US would build the United Nations. It would be uh, housed essentially in New York City, which would be sort of an unofficial capital of the world. And the US basically felt we now have to take the mantle. Uh, France was humiliated in this war and occupied. Britain was bankrupted. The Soviets were absolutely weakened. 26 million people killed. Germ uh, Germany and Japan were defeated. It was up to us the rich and wealthy nation, the democracy to rebuild everything and try to build an everlasting peace. And so we do the month after the war. The Bretton Woods Agreement came about where we were now gonna promote free trade. We were going to give lots of money to European countries to rebuild. But this war is a huge turning point, not just in American history, but in world history, where the US is gonna take a leading role in global politics. After World War I, there were still many countries that were very strong and we decided to abandon Europe. Our attitude was let the French handle the Germans. That was laughable at this point. The French didn't handle anything in World War II. God bless the French, I love them, but they didn't handle it very well. The British couldn't handle it anymore. Uh, and we didn't like the Soviets that much. They were sort of temporary allies. We had to defend the world from them as well. And so that's the end of World War II. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. We will continue next, next time talking about the peace that is to come. And we will grow even more powerful as a nation. Isn't it great? Okay, guys. I will see you next time. Have a good one.